Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 711, that is 711, that is 711 or 711 actually, correct me there. Thank you for coming back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 711 with I, your host Agostino Zynga and I hope you're doing well today, I really do hope you're doing well because I'm not in the best of spirits, I cannot deny, I've just come I'm from watching flipping United lose three <laughs> two at home to Galatasaray, and I am questioning my will to live. Really, I'm really struggling to really care about my team anymore. I'm starting to hate the team the same way I used to hate the team under Oli, under Jose Mourinho, under parts of Luba and Gal's tenure. And I know the reality of it is that it's not always the manager's fault, especially in this scenario that we're in at the moment. We have terrible, terrible owners who have essentially um, built or crafted or, you know, led the club down a very, very dark, dark, dark path over the last few years. And we're now reaping the rewards of it. There's obviously a very toxic working environment at the club, which is leading to the players who are very average, who haven't achieved much in the game themselves, um, feeling like they are in control, like they can get managers run out of the club, which they obviously have in the past. But I think all of those things in general are really adding to my ambivalence with the club. I'm getting to the point where I'm just not caring anymore. And that's never a good place to be as a fan because part of the reason following a club is because you care, because you love the team and you want to see them do well and it makes you feel good. So when they stop making you feel good and they stop making you feel bad and you're feeling indifferent, it's usually a really, really bad sign. And that's where I'm at at the moment. But you know what? We pod, we continue, we entertain, we do the best we can with the time available because you know what? Tomorrow isn't guaranteed. So, I was checking some stuff online and I was seeing this whole HS2 moniker being banded around and I wasn't really sure what was going on. What the hell is HS2? What the hell is this, right? And essentially HS2 was a government program that was um, first put forward by the Labour Party in order to connect parts of Northern England with other parts of Northern England. And the idea or the premise behind it was that there's um, long been um, said in the UK that there's a big North and South divide. A lot of the government, especially here in the House of Commons, care a lot about what happens in the South, but rarely care about improving the lives of people that live in the North outside of London. And they said that this rail line would be the first step into kind of repairing those um, rifts and kind of doing right by people in the north by connecting them with high speed rails. And the idea behind it would that it would increase, I think it would decrease the time it takes to get to London to Manchester. At the moment now, it's, I think it's an hour 30 or maybe two hours. But I think I saw somewhere along the lines of this particular new train would take um, maybe an hour to get from London to Manchester. But the other thing that was really um, beneficial about it was that it would connect other parts of northern england with other parts of it so you'd be able to go from manchester to leeds really quickly manchester to birmingham really quickly so essentially what that would do you would hope is that it would ease the pressure on the other lines so that you could have people if they wanted to go directly to birmingham they wouldn't need to jump on the other lines are a bit slower they'd go on a speedier train and then that would allow you to have a way more um you know consistent and reliable service because even though our train lines are very old even though they're incredibly over prescribed a lot of the reason why they kind of break down a lot is because of the traffic there's just too many people and too much demand for it um, all you know all around the clock so obviously high speed rails would help to alleviate some of that even if the price is super high it would obviously help to just alleviate some of that pressure and i think the same could be said for clubs that's why i've kind of always um pushed for the idea of we need to have way more nightclubs in london especially that are maybe like fold or a bit bigger so maybe like 1000 capacity plus right and maybe just fall underneath the 1500 capacity so that what would happen if you have one of those clubs per area in london north west and south and they all open until six it will take the strain away from some of the other clubs and most likely what it would do i think inadvertently is that it would also um decrease antisocial behavior because people can if they want to go out and stay out after four or after 2 a.m they can go to this club which is similar to fold that's what we have here in east london 
And then if they want to flip and go home early, they can. But they're not kind of put into a corner where they have to kind of make the night work at a club that's only open until four. And then that leads to just a whole hodgepodge of people all congregating in one space and it gets really crazy. But again, what do I know? So we continue. Well, unfortunately, that HS2 line, courtesy of the BBC here, has now been scrapped. And this to me has been another reminder of the H of the fucking North South divide. And embarrassingly enough for me, I only really realized this North South divide was a thing when COVID was happening. I never even bothered to pay too much mind about it. But when COVID happened and we had all these weird um, lockdown restrictions and you can only go out at certain times and stuff. I remember there was a time when they were doing lockdowns based on the area that you were in. And for some reason, all the time, the North always got the rough end of the stick. They always got the short end of the stick, sorry. They'd always get um, a restriction that meant that they weren't, op- they weren't able to open bars, restaurants, whatever it may be. So basically, loads of local businesses in the North kind of fu- kind of basically went down and under and i think if you have been traveling to the north anytime soon parts of liverpool and manchester you would have seen over the last few years especially if you went there pre-covid a lot of the stores and shops i remember seeing when i went there before covid when you go there after covid most of them are gone it's pretty depressing going to those places it's, not, it's always a bit of humbling when you go to those places because it's definitely not as busy and as kind of you know whatever as london is of course with the shops and shit but there's definitely been um, an impact with COVID. You can see that, it, you know, the lockdowns, the restrictions, all these sort of stuff has definitely negatively impacted a lot of the people. So you can only imagine some people who are thinking, hey, this HS2 line could give us a lifeline. It could allow us to maybe um, connect to different parts of, of the UK. It could even increase things like I'm interested in clubs. Maybe there's people in London who actually want to go clubbing in Manchester and Liverpool and Birmingham and Newcastle and stuff, but don't because there's no high speed lines because a lot of the lines that you're going on, they're stopping at every fucking stop between here and manchester and it just doesn't make it worthwhile to try and go there in the morning and come back or in the night and come back early morning but maybe with a high-speed rail even if it is really expensive you can justify doing a big day trip like people do in europe that's the one thing that i really um think that i didn't take advantage of when we were still in the eu like erasmus and just traveling around flipping um, erasmus obviously the education thing where you could go in and study in different colleges and places around europe and stuff in your gap year whatever you want to do and also the ability to just go traveling around europe because i think now um if i'm not mistaken with us being out of europe i think i've only got 30 days basically to travel without having a visa and stuff which obviously isn't long enough if you want to do a really long sort of like trip around um, parts of Europe and just connect with trains and shit but that's something that I heard of a lot of people who I'm friends with who kind of go out in the night who are part of the nightlife scene who just live in Europe they say that's a big part of their fucking you know of their scene of their culture of jumping on trains and going to you know different countries because it's fucking europe and you're all landlocked you could just quickly jump on the train and head to poland jump on the train head to romania go to fucking ukraine when there wasn't any war go to georgia all these different places and just have a good time rave wherever and still come back in the morning without getting any accommodation you know what i mean you could actually go and have a good time that way so and obviously in the process visit all these interesting places around europe um but obviously um we don't really have that ability to do that in london mostly because you have to get hotels or in the uk mostly because of the tra- we don't really have a lot of fast connecting trains to the north we have a lot of fast connecting trains that take you to parts of the south and stuff to connect to dover to go to you know the euro tunnel and whatnot but not a lot of places going up north so that's a bit of bit, been a big shame but anyway let me read the article here courtesy of bbc it says rishi shunak would announce the scrapping of the hs2 high-speed rail line from the west midland to manchester on wednesday um, in his Conservative Party conference speech, the PM is expected to set out a range of alternative projects in the north of England and Wales. He is likely to argue that these projects will be better value for money and can be delivered more quickly. From what I've read online, the whole reason why this has been over, you know, they spent too much money and they have to scrap it now, is because, if I'm not mistaken, they try to do too much. I think when you're trying to basically do these type of projects, they say that you should try to do them in small increments. So instead of trying to deliver the entire network um, overhaul and change, you should try to build a station first, then the railway, then another station, then, the, you know, make sure the trains are okay, then whatever connecting place that you need. You're meant to be doing them all in tiny little projects in increments. But when you try and do it all as one big project, and you're also using using loads of different um, s- contractors and stuff to kind of fulfill some of the things and obviously the contractors mean different types of lawyers different types of red tape it's just an it's just a breeding ground for delays exploitation scamming probably you know what i mean there's a lot of stuff going on there so it's obviously starting to cost way too much money and they decide to scrap it but the argument for the people in the north is that 
there's a lot of things that waste a lot of money. There's a lot of things that they probably overpaid for that they still go through with. And they just found it easier to scrap this because it's something to do with the North, um, which is really interesting to kind of dive on deep on. It continues here. It says, rumors could be it, rumors it could be scrapped um have already prompted anger among local leaders and businessmen labor manchester mayor andy burnham who's a fucking g um ditching a link to the city would be a permanent state statement to people in the north that they were second class citizens when it comes to transport which is basically true i it was brutal but i saw it during covid there was definitely a different type of treatment given to the north um vis-a-vis -vis the, the south when covid was happening for some reason which was utterly bizarre especially when i remember there was one particular time the north had better numbers than us like they had le less you know less people getting infected whatever it may be but they still were had to be locked down for a certain amount of time and i was like jesus christ um the conservative west midland mayor andy street who on monday called the impromptu press conference at the party conference to warn sunak that getting rid of hs2 would amount to cancelling the future is said to be distraught by the news of the prime minister's decision the football club Manchester United was among 30 businesses which wrote to Prime Minister urging him to commit to a line and avoid economic self-sabotage. He had hoped the HS2 would cut journey times, create more space for rail network and boost jobs outside of London. That's true because you'd imagine, because I remember one time when I was working at this company that was like an art supplies company and there was a lady that was working there with me um, in the lab, sorry, at the company at the, in the lab and she was living in Birmingham at the time and this place I used to work at was next to like Labrook Grove so like West London basically London right and she lived in Birmingham and she was commuting back and forth from Birmingham every single day insane thing to do because I'm sure that rail ticket must have been crazy because if there's one thing about the UK we have decent trains we have decent underground um, oh, the underground is really good, but the prices, the seasonal ticket prices are crazy. So I can imagine she must have been paying, I don't know, she must have been paying easily a, more than a grand a month um, to fucking go from Birmingham to London and then London to Birmingham every single day using that like, as a commuter train. So imagine how beneficial it would have been to have a high speed rail line going from London to parts of the north. It would have maybe allowed people to actually have jobs, full time jobs going back and forth and be able to go on those type of trains, even if it's expensive because people are doing it now with the shit trains imagine if you've got a direct train that only stops twice in the middle so it's it's, it's really uh, as much as it would cost them a lot of money to do it it's also going to have ramifications with the economy you know that are going to be felt for maybe many many years to come that's the actual crazy thing about it um, however it have been concerns about the mounting cost of the infrastructure project with the latest estimates of the project um, amounting to about 71 billion but it was in 2019 prices um so it does not account for the spike in cost of materials and wages for example in recent months last month's defense secretary grant shapps said that it will be crazy not to review the project particularly given the rise in inflation deputy chair and conservative pro party lee anderson has described hs2 as a bad gamble not really i think it's a good gamble but unfortunately now you know you probably couldn't um you probably couldn't what's that thing called you probably couldn't account for the economy going the way it did or maybe you could i'm not really too sure but if you're looking to gear up to a general election, which is happening very soon here in the UK, you'd think, but again, the UK is odd, much like America. Sometimes people vote against their best interest. So I would say this is not the best tactic to go into a general election, but you never know. The Conservatives might win by a landslide still, even though they've pissed off half of the nation. You know what I mean? It might just still be okay for them. Who knows? And there's obviously Rishi Sunak in the middle, our fucking beleaguered and inept and bit clueless fucking Prime Minister. It continues to say the route was initially proposed in 2010 and given a go-ahead in 2012. And then the Transport Secretary, Justin Greening, said it was the most significant transport infrastructure project since the building of the motorways. So this was pro proposed in 2010. And go ahead was in 2012, so more than 20 years, and it's only been cancelled now. Obviously, you have to account for COVID, three and a half years, cool. But Jesus Christ, bro, it shows you just how slow government moves, isn't it? The wheels of government are just as slow as the wheels of law. It's just insane, bro, how long shit takes to get done. Like, absolutely insane. There have already been delays, disruption, a big cut to HS2 Eastern Leg and a salami slicing of HS2, but this later decision will change the project to its outcomes beyond recognition. At least $22 billion has already been spent building the London to Birmingham section, while $22, well, $2.3 billion has gone towards the second phase on things such as buying up land and property. So they already built it, 
half of the line and now they're just going to scrap it because they can't go through the rest of it jesus christos Thirty thousand people already working in hs2 mostly in supply chain there's also been uh, people's lives who have already been uprooted by property purchases along the hs2 route to birmingham mr sunak announces that the hs two trains will go to manchester using existing tracks it follows that no extra space will be created and journey time benefits will be reduced jesus christos bro so that's the planned route that they were going to look for to go so you'd see here from london to houston where i mean i'm in london and this train will be able to go all the way all the way up to birmingham parts of the obviously manchester and whatnot liverpool but now it's all been flipping cancelled and obviously the one to leeds got cancelled and all these are major cities outside of london major cities that you would imagine you know um, would be bolstered by having the connection to london be so quick um it would kind of increase business all around these big cities and shit but unfortunately they scrapped it in recent days there have been suggestions that instead of building hs2 the money could be put towards improving the rail east works like in london england <laughs> exactly but improving is a big broad term what does improve improvement mean does that mean having a shelter on the train stations does improving mean installing wi-fi more bins benches improvement when it comes to government stuff is it's a lot of shit i remember there was one particular um article i read about some big government thing that they spent millions on i think in somewhere in la and it just amounted to these weird lamppost things that had these weird shelter things on the top of it i don't know what the point of it was but that was a big project that they spent millions and millions in so the amount of um delays in government and the amount of misuse of funds is pretty pretty high and i'm sure a lot of it has to do with people getting stuff in brown envelopes i'm sure of it i'm sure because i don't i can't in, in you know my common sense brain can't imagine that there's that many inept um and dumb people within government all working there at the same time i'm sure most of it just happens to just be like one of those things where it's sort of like working in the you know in the building industry delays are just part of the business because the business is making money and if you want to make money you add delays to make the job longer do you know what i mean so maybe it's just part of government it's just like an in it's just an intrinsic part of what they do by the way it's one of those things what people say it's like it's a bug not a, it's a feature not a bug kind of type of thing i wonder if that's the case but again um thoughts and feelings go out to my people up there in the north of england um absolutely heinous that this is happening they should have just went through with it anyway regardless of the cost it's already over budget so what does another 20 fucking billion really Really gonna do and it really and i think it would have honestly reaped its rewards it would have been amazing for the north it would have opened up the entire country um especially for places like manchester where i'm thinking about warehouse project that big club that's there that i've always wanted to go to that could have you know i'm sure there's a whole economy of people who travel around england i don't necessarily do it because i usually prefer to go to festivals um in europe because they're way more cost effective but i'm sure there are people in england who do like road trips or do train trips to go to festivals or clubs around england um experience different things and shit and that would have opened up the entirety of England to do that maybe even you know open up for you to go to places like scotland maybe going from scotland from the middle uh, from the mid um uh from the north of england is a bit easier or midlands whatever than it is from london who knows but now it's been cancelled and now you know the fucking focus will be back on flipping london and you know what they do here and stuff and don't let there come out any report that they misuse funds or anything or that they're planning to do something else crazy like that's why i'm saying now if they approve that sphere in london people are gonna go off imagine they're scrapping that entire plan to connect parts of north england midlands of england right that are usually overlooked and ignored right they're gonna they cancel this entire plan now imagine if they scrap this and they decide to install that same sphere that they have in las vegas in london which allegedly is the plan there's meant to be a plan to have this same sphere they have in las vegas um set up in london also but they haven't got planning permission being approved yet and it costs i don't know billions to fucking get it done it's obviously very nice and great to look at but just imagine how angry you would be if you live in the north and they approved the planning application for this and they gave the people that are building it you know subsidies and shit oh you'd be so angry you'd be so angry bro so 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 angry so yeah let's pray it doesn't happen moving on we got this story to talk about courtesy of the bbc regarding the bed bud bed bug sorry panic that's sweeping flipping paris absolutely wild it's been pretty interesting to see and to read accounts from people online about just how traumatic and how much ptsd people have from having bed bugs and i thought i was the only person i thought only i was traumatically scarred by having bed bugs like i had it twice 
right twice yeah i had it once when i was living at home and once when i moved out and both occasions were especially when i was living at home i think it was mostly a reminder about just how hard i needed to work to kind of change my circumstances and obviously help my family and obviously help myself to kind of get out of that situation and kind of pull my you know help pull my family out the flipping debts of poverty because i grew up in a fucking horrible neighborhood and you know not didn't have the most money in the world but it also reminded me of just how quickly <laughs> little things can turn into big things because usually bed bugs especially from my neighborhood growing up it's just mostly just you know a, a build up of dirt and stuff and just lack of hygiene and all sorts of other things that's happening especially near that i live in with you know bin men going on strike and stuff and bins piling up all over the street and bloody blah, blah 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 sanitary hygiene all that stuff can add to it and it just reminds you again it's just a very big humbler as to where you are currently at and where you need to go to avoid those situations but the experience of having bed bugs never leaves you and i remember one particular occasion when i had bed bugs and i remember i think i was working at the time at dr martin's or something and i was talking to a, a, a customer on the shop floor and i think i noticed before they noticed it but i was wearing like a flannel shirt and i saw a fucking bed bug bed bug sorry creep crawling out of my flipping flannel shirt pocket my chest pocket i saw it creeping out of my chest pocket like that and i quickly was able to kind of just pat it away without them realizing but i was like oh my god i've got bed bugs on my clothes bro i'm transporting them from my home all the way to fucking central london where i was working at i was like oh my god i had to change my circle that's when i went whatever i got flipping people to come over fumigation that whole thing which cost an arm and a leg but jesus christ i remember that just being one of the times where i felt so utterly disgusting i can't even begin to you know describe but just imagine how crazy it must be living in paris right gay paris um this beautiful place all your dreams and aspirations are connected to it all you think about it is beauty and architecture and culture and all this stuff and then they get a bed bug panic. Absolutely crazy, especially before the Olympics. So let's read the article. Um, actually, let's watch a bit of the video, actually, courtesy here of the BBC. Let's see what the video is saying. On, the, on board a train in France, there's a bed bug crawling on one of the seats. There's something underneath the beds as well, it looks like, or the chairs. You can see them everywhere where they usually are found. God almighty. More again in the chairs and stuff. Jesus Christos. Some dead some still crawling around but anyway let's read the article see what it says a plague of bed bugs has hit paris and other french cities provoking a wave of insectophobia and raising questions about health and safety during this year's olympic games or next year sorry um the broadly um that's broadly how the phenomenon has been described in france and international news media in part it's true but in part it's not what is the case of the number of bed bug sightings have increased over the last few weeks and the upward trend of several bugs? Um, every late summer, we see an increase in bed bugs, says Jean Michel Berenger, an etymologist in Marseille. It is because people have been moving about over August and July um, and they bring back their luggage. Each year, the seasonal increase is bigger than the last. So, this has been happening for a while. God almighty. In Paris, the long standing fear of infestation felt by flat dwellers, one in 10 of whom have experienced bed bugs in the last five years, according to the official, have been added to new sources, um, new sources of angst. Reports of um, Punasius. What is that? Punasius or Punasius um, have been recently seen in cinemas that have been proven but are taken seriously. Um, likewise, claims that people have been bitten on trains. <laughs> Can you imagine getting bitten by a bed bug on a train to work? Shit. Now both Paris City Hall and President Emmanuel Macron um, government are calling for action. It's a measure of how seriously they take the issue and how they need to protect the image of Paris ahead of the 2024 games that they are not dismissing the bed bug panic as a social media invent invention. Sorry, Because that is also part of the story. Scare stories are flashing across the internet so fast that it's, it's turning what once was the newspapers a reliable slow day chestnut into a national emergency. Cinema owners already worried about the declining attendance are seriously spooked by the videos circulating showing iron identify mites on the seat people on metros are having checking their upholstery and some prefer to stand imagine the panic that exists in paris right now people standing everywhere people double checking their seats spraying them and shit i guess that lady that everyone was fucking dunking on on social media earlier the one that goes to hotel rooms and cleans everything i guess she's not looking so crazy now huh everybody was dunking on her because she's a bit overweight and she's wasting her time cleaning rooms in hotels when she could just stay at home or just take it as it is now you see why people do that sort of thing once you've been stung once you've been bit by stuff like bed bugs or affected by it it's very difficult to not 
you know, to not unsee those things. It's kind of part of your psyche. Like even now talking about it, parts of my ears are flipping, feeling really itchy and shit. Um, there is a new element this year, and that is a general psychosis which has been taken hold, says Mr. Beringer. It is a good thing in a way because it serves to make people aware of the problem, and the sooner you act the, on bed bugs, the better. But a lot of the problem is being exaggerated. So they're trying to obviously stem the flipping, you know, craziness online, but the reality is a reality. Most people that are seeing the bed bugs are seeing them. They're not seeing things, but obviously they don't want people to go in full blown panic and start fucking burning their neighbors' homes because of fear of catching fucking bed bugs. The fact of the matter is that the bed bugs are making a comeback and have been perhaps in twenty or thirty years, but it's not just in France but everywhere. There are several factors of which globalizations, container trade, tourism, immigration is the most important. Climate change can be ruled out. The bed bug, um, was it Simex lecturius, um, to give it its next latin name is a domesticated creature domesticated bed bugs so is somebody keeping them as pets I'm, i bet there's some sort of freak that actually has bed bugs as like a a thing that they have as a pet I, i'm sure there is it goes it goes um this domestic creature um it goes where humans go whether it doesn't come into it after World War II, bed bugs, like many other beasties, were massively reduced in numbers in the widespread use of DDT. But over the years, DDT and many other chemicals have been banned because of the effects of humans. In the meantime, bed bugs population has been altered uh, by the elimination of those creatures who were genetically susceptible to chemical eradication in the first place. Those that survived DDT blitz are the ancestors of today's breed. <laughs> <laughs> who are results of the far more restraint a third factor may be the decline in cockroaches thanks largely to the cleaner homes cockroaches are bed bugs predators um fear not though no one's suggesting reinfesting homes with cockroaches in order to deal with the less put imagine that people people actually having cockroaches in their home to deal with bed bugs According to Beringer, in the developed world, people are liable to panic about bed bugs because it's lost on the collective memory of them. In other parts of the world, they are still common and people keep the threat in, pop in proportion. Yeah, it being common is still not something that I would be saying is acceptable and be happy to have. I'm sorry. The truth is that bed bugs are indeed a menace, but the danger is more psychological than physical. Um, Cinemex, Cimex lecturius may be revolting, but as far as it's known, it cannot transmit disease. Its bites are loathsome, but they do not last long. But they still itchy. They still make you feel gross. Having all these cracking creatures all over you, especially when you're sleeping, it's not the greatest. So these guys are trying to make it seem like it's not a big deal, but it clearly is. But one thing we need to do is that we owe this kid a big apology. Do you remember this kid that went viral over, uh, I think maybe a few months back on social media, this American kid, because he went to Paris and he basically wasn't a fan of Paris overall and said it was disgusting. We owe this guy a big apology because maybe he was onto something. Maybe he was onto something about Paris. Y'all save all y'all money, all y'all lives to come here. Hmm. <laughs> Let me be the one to break your bubble. First of all, Paris stink. It smelled like piss, cheese, and armpit. Child eating the damn pigeons was crazy. And ain't nothing to do but eat at cafes. You will see a cafe on every corner because there's no activities here and the food is so mid. That's why there's hella fast food, American fast food chains, because their food don't taste like shit. And that shit look grimy as hell. Paris look grimy as hell in dungeon. Post-apocalyptic, everywhere you go, it was graffiti. The buildings weren't inviting, they weren't welcoming. <laughs> it was actually a horror sight to see. Like, this was shocking to me. They will never show you that this is what Paris really looks like. Mm -hmm. In the Eiffel Tower, child, this was the trail to the Eiffel Damn Tower. This was the most hype shit I've ever seen. Outside of this tower, it ain't shit to do. There's no mom culture. They don't know how to capitalize off their culture. It's just this damn tower. <laughs> it's just this damn tower you say it looks like the middle east people will tell you to go to the Eiffel tower at night because in daytime it looks like rust of course it looks good at the night that's why they stay they say turn the lights off when you when you uh when you're fucking <laughs> but you can't see the person's ugly or not <laughs> you don't learn much about french culture because they don't capitalize off the things that they're known for like mimes which is a fucking super ignorant american thing to say the only thing that um, french people are known for are mimes like what um, anytime someone says the place looks better at night it's a red flag i understand what he means because i think paris paris is interesting as a city anyway because i said it plenty of times before but it's the only place i've been to 
so far in the times that I've in the places I've visited around the world again I'm not the you know I, I'm not I'm not the biggest traveler but I have been to a fair amount of good places and it's probably the only place that I can say hands down where your experience of it is highly dependent on who you go with who you know over there and who you know over there basically you really can't have a good first time in Paris on your own I don't think it's possible I really don't you kind of have to know a bit about the city, maybe know a couple of people and stuff to really get an appreciation of what Paris is like as a city and like it. I think other places, you can come on your own and just be able to say, yeah, this is shit. Like London is a good example. London, I think, is an easy place to come to and realise and figure out quickly is this, if it's for you or not. You'd be like, you know what? This place is shit. Overrated. Same goes for New York. You could go to New York, visit it and say, you know what? This place is fucking awesome. I love it. But Paris is the only place where even if you say it's terrible, if you go back a second time, a third time with somebody that actually is actually from there or that, or you know people that live over there, it completely changes your experience and you absolutely fall in love with it. Honestly, I swear to God. So it's got that really weird bit about it, but it's also got a very weird sort of like chic, chicness about it that's also a bit dirty. Like one of the places that I like to visit a lot are on the kind of outer rings, right? Which are kind of like where the hoods are, right? Where it's all like full of kind of the blocks of flats and stuff that you see on all the fucking famous French movies and French TV series and shit. Those places are usually quite fun to hang out with because it's quite quote unquote multicultural. There's loads of good restaurants and shit, great places to go and party, blah, 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 blah. But the center of Paris is also really nice too because it's super bougie. It's a place that you see in, again, in all the flipping um, Hollywood movies. You can walk along the canal and blah, 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 blah. You go to cool bookshops, eat, you know, at nice restaurants, drink cafe and cafe bars and whatnot, sit down and people watch. All those things are quite amazing, but there's parts of Paris that are hidden behind doors, like people's, after, people's you know, after parties, um, certain clubs that you're only allowed to go to if you know certain people even certain book clubs and readings and presentations and theaters and stuff it's all kind of like needs to know basis so it's a hard place to really enjoy on your own as an expat or as a tourist kind of just figuring stuff out solo it's very difficult to enjoy and to like it but it's also very kind of jarring because it kind of reminds me a little bit i think the guy even said in the video it's kind of like middle east but it's a lot like central europe or even eastern europe when you go to parts of berlin for instance the city that i kind of love and go to a lot you're like oh this place isn't the greatest it's even places like um when i went to prague one time um in the czech republic when you just venture a little bit outside of prague like five to ten minutes walk even you start to see how quickly um the place starts to resemble any other place that you would imagine visiting in central to eastern europe very industrial loads of um bricks everywhere loads of fucking graffiti like very downtrodden yeah very like bleak as soon as you step out of prague the kind of main city where all the fucking tourists are in the main wherever it may be so i think the same thing happens in paris but the paris kind of juxtaposition of it kind of feels a bit nicer when you go there but again it takes a bit of time to get your eyes used to it so big up that kid and i think we owe him a big 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 apology moving on i want to talk about this quickly because i saw this topic being spoken about in the Bergheim community subreddit and i think i was just to kind of touch on it a little bit because i'm still confused as to how this has become such a thing so i've been reading that there's been an uptick of people in the scene that i am part of you know maybe the dance music scene electronic music scene techno scene whatever it may be the club scene that are, that are recreationally on nights out going out and taking ketamine right and i don't necessarily understand what's going on i don't get how ketamine has now become a rave drug because from the times that i've taken it which has maybe been a handful of times maybe like three times in my entire life it's legitimately been something that i have questioned my life decisions after i've taken it i've been like you know what i'm never doing this again it's completely ruined my night um it's you know disturbed everything i was going to do and just made me question how people can rave on it and now it's become a really popular thing because i'm reading reports of people going to fucking djs playing at techno festivals dj playing at clubs and stuff dropping behind the booth and having a couple of flipping bumps of ketamine while they're playing which is to me one of the most creative drugs you can take because it legitimately shifts your perception of fucking reality so to be in a k-hole and to attempt to fucking play at a nightclub seems to me like one of the most risque decisions you could ever 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 take like why would you do that to yourself i do not understand but clearly people are doing it and i don't know if it's because i'm just not adept at taking it 
I'm not too sure if it's them taking a certain type of ketamine. I'm not really too sure because the only one I know is there's two in it. There's one that's called like a rice one and there's one that's more like crystal. I forgot there's two versions anyway that you can usually get. And and usually people will smash it up and they will grind it up and try and sniff it. And from my experience, that stuff tastes like glass going up your nose. It's not pleasurable at all. It's very, very sharp sort of like pain in the inside of your nostrils when you're doing it. It really doesn't feel pleasant. So the bumps aren't even enjoyable, right? Um, the effects might have be, been, but the actual process of taking that thing from powder into your nostrils isn't the most pleasurable experience. So I can't imagine taking that stuff and then doing it to then go and play. It's absolutely wild. But I'm wondering if the reason why people are taking ketamine now in clubs might have to do with the price because the price and the quality of other drugs especially stuff like coke and stuff like mdma and molly and stuff and um, lsd whatever it may be um the quality of those stuff is starting to go down but the price is starting to go up and there's also the very um very real possibility that you might get stuff that's like laced with fentanyl and shit and most likely you're not going to get that with stuff like ketamine right um you well, you'd hope not so maybe people are being a bit more safe especially in maybe the berlin scene where people kind of you know even though they're 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 fucking caners they still have a lot of um um trepidation with just ingesting anything and everything so maybe they're trying to limit um the amount of um you know bad things that could happen by taking something that they know that most likely isn't going to be cut with something maybe that's a reason but i'm honestly bewildered and shocked that people out there are honestly doing fucking ketamine as a clubbing drug it's absolutely crazy to see it was already crazy when i saw people doing balloons to, to go out with right because again I'm, I'm used to growing up at a time when balloons were usually sold to you as you were leaving the club as a sort of like okay here's a final little thing to do before you leave on your way home but i couldn't imagine doing it as like a part of my night out to go out as a sort of like precursor to my night or to kind of aid me or during my evening it just doesn't mean something that i would ever want to do but clearly i'm in a minority because there's a bunch of people out there especially djs who are legitimately taking this and also flipping being able to play and dance around in clubs and stuff and i can't understand why that's the case i think there needs to be a lot to be said if you're getting into a scene new and you're just starting djing it's really important i feel like when you start getting involved in it to just be as sober as possible when you're playing personally i feel like building a habit where you only can dj when you're fucked up isn't a great thing for the long term and i think in general you need to get to a point where you realize for better or worse where you let where you sit are you somebody that djs as an excuse to get fucked or are you somebody that enjoys to play music and if somebody provides you with some drugs hey to you know to maybe increase the fun of your night you might take it but if you're more so the party person you might have to just avoid avoid the djing thing because it probably isn't going to go well for you especially being an artist long term and shit because sooner rather than the end you're probably going to hit a wall and i just imagine as well artistically and creatively i'd want to have the use of all my functions to get the best work that I can out of myself, Stone Cold Sober, without relying on that crux of drugs. Because when they're not around, and then I hit a creativity block, I'm going to feel so shit, because I feel like I wouldn't have the capacity to do it without doing the drugs. So I feel like a lot of people should focus more on just doing great work, making great art, um, you know, uh, making a name for themselves, building their career before they go down that path. And from what I've heard anyway, it's mostly just established, you know, stand, not stand up, established fucking DJs who are obviously indulging. But I just feel like in general, it's not the correct thing to do. I just feel like as a performer, I feel like you owe the fans, you owe the punters, uh, you, you, you owe them your all. And I don't think you can ever give them your all if you're fucked. It's just impossible to do so. Um, it's not going to end well in that way. So I think the best thing to do is to probably try and play as sober as possible. And then if you want to have fun and do what needs to be done, do it after your set. I think that's always the thing that I've kind of adopted. And really for me, whenever I was playing out, I'll be too nervous to do anything because I want to make sure that I'm remembering my set. I know what sort of stuff I wanted to play. I'm kind of, uh, you know, um, aware of my surroundings so I can quote unquote read the room and I know what to play next and blah, blah, blah. I've got a million things going through my head. The last thing I'm thinking about is getting fucked on booze or getting fucked on drugs. That can wait another time whether it's later down the night, whether it's later on another night, it's not that imperative. Obviously when I'm out, it's a different story, but when I'm playing, I want to be, um, you know, 
I'm at my best, basically. I don't want to be super fucked up and slosh. And for me personally, I don't see how you can mix the both. I really don't. But again, I, I've seen certain streamers online who legitimately will stream for six plus hours drinking and taking loads of drugs and shit. And they seem fairly okay. You know, some slurred words here and there, but they seem fairly functional. So maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just a P-U-S-S-Y. And maybe I need to put my big boy pants on, get flipped up and start doing what everybody else is doing online and start doing what everyone else is doing online next so this is an odd one to talk about because i feel like you know it might come across like i am judging but i'm not judging but i kind of am but i'm kind of not right so i've seen this really interesting um little i saw this really interesting video this mix courtesy of um whore that features this dj called dragon girl and in this particular video where dragon girl plays um it's very apparent when you watch the video that she has you know very 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 long armpit hair and she has a, this incredibly revealing top on so you can see her boobies bouncing around as she's dancing and shit and it's kind of hard not to see these things again I'm not trying to objectify her but it's just an imperative of what we're seeing it made me think of two things Number one, it made me think of that thing I said before when it comes to like DJing and stuff. There's this un there's this thing that people kind of don't want to talk about where it's like part of the success of somebody or part of your ability to be successful is sometimes your image. And if you're a woman, sometimes I can imagine it could be very difficult to kind of wrestle or to, you know, accept that if you are conventionally attractive, like you'd probably want to use it to your advantage because the DJing field and the DJing industry is incredibly competitive. I think I'm an amazing DJ. I think I'm probably one of the best out there and I don't play anywhere, right? I'm just somebody playing in their fucking bedroom. So if I think I'm really good, there must be a bunch of people out there who are playing in a couple of bars, a couple of clubs here and there who never get a chance to play at some of the bigger clubs. So the competition is crazy. There's probably too much of us DJs and not enough opportunities. So any angle advantage that you could get to kind of give yourself a head start, to jump in front of the queue, to squeeze in here, squeeze in there you should take it whether it's affirmative action like the kind of thing that i was proposing about fold right like trying to quote unquote fake cancel fold but only having white resident djs and then getting myself propped up to be the only black resident dj there fuck it however you get in you get in but then once you get in you show and prove with your talent and your skill and if it's your attractive female or attractive woman um once you get in um with your looks and what you know and maybe your assets and stuff why not then once you get through the door prove them right by completely changing your looks or whatever or maybe not making it super important but then focusing mainly on your art so that people can be respectful of you as an artist not just because you look really hot and they want to oogle at you those are two things but i wonder i'm wondering now if that's necessary and if that's the right way to think about things and maybe me just talking the way about it that way that i'm talking about it is maybe adding to the problem i'm not really too sure but it is quite interesting to see this sort of stuff because it's kind of very apparent very striking and kind of something you can't really unsee but it also goes to show like how you know how far we have to go as a society that i would see a woman playing you know in a, a woman playing a live stream dj set and the first thing that i would notice apart from what she's playing and whether or not I like the music or not would be the armpit hair sticking out of her armpits right that'd be the first thing i'm noticing not even literally her looks literally more so just the armpit hair in the armpits the first thing that kind of came to mind when i was seeing this clip um you know playing here in the background here which i've got to mute because obviously the flipping songs are definitely going to be um copyright striked and stuff right that's the first thing that kind of came to mind i couldn't unsee this when i originally saw it i was like bloody hell mate those are some real hairs underneath there it's like i haven't seen a woman that looks like that in a very long time now don't get me wrong in berlin it's definitely something a lot of women have kind of adopted as um as um as a feminist sort of thing in terms of kind of trying to i guess uh buckle the conventional you know beauty standards and whatever it may be or something to do with the patriarchy i'm not really too sure but it's definitely something that you see a lot in berlin but it's definitely something that i remember just checking now and um, when i see this kind of coming across my timeline i was like oh you don't really see that too often but again i think personally for me as i said when it comes to my advice when it comes to trying to get into the scene if anybody wants my advice which you really shouldn't take because i'm nobody but i feel like you should use every advantage every advantage to get through 
Because unfortunately, this industry isn't really about your skill, about your ability to play music and shit. Yes, it's nice that this set that she's playing, um, you know, it's not really my type of music. It's a little bit hyper poppy. It's a little bit Euro trashy, Euro dance, hard dance, whatever you want to call that style of music. It's not really for me. But in terms of her construction of her set, it sounds really good. She's a proficient DJ. She can clearly sequence properly, has a good ear for tunes, can mix. All the things that you want to be a DJ. But I wouldn't be talking about her right now if she wasn't wearing this top and if she didn't have these very long armpit hairs underneath her arms. It's, that's the fucking reality of it. And that's the real unfortunate reality of the scene and maybe life in general. The work and the quality of work really doesn't matter. It really is all about image. And if you're able to harness that for your for yourself, um, to your benefit, you can really go a long, 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 long way. Um, and it's one of those unfortunate parts of the industry. It really, really is. Because I'm sure, most likely, again, I haven't checked her social media, but I'm pretty sure her social media is pretty popping. She's probably got a decent social media. You know, she's a good looking um, Caucasian lady um, who wears what she wears and stuff. And she probably lives in Berlin and whatever it may be. I'm sure she's got a fairly decent social media following as well so you know whatever you can do to get ahead whatever you can do to kind of burst through do it but then i think what you owe to yourself to do oh, she's wearing production headphones is it interesting she's wearing headphones that you meant to wear as a studio as a dj but anyway it doesn't matter so but one thing i think you should do if you are that person who uses your looks as a, as a sort of like um trojan horse to get in you owe it to yourself if you're a real artist and you really want longevity in the scene. I think it doesn't, it doesn't actually matter, actually. Let me scrap that. If you get in just on your looks and you just want to do a cash grab anyway, right? Fuck it. Because you're not, you know, again, we, we all know how flipping, how it works in the entertainment industry for women is anyway. It's very different compared to men. Women don't have a longer shelf life. Do you know what I mean? For some reason, men can play at the highest levels, like, you know, the Carl Cox or these kind of guys until they're very, very old age. But for some time, for some reason, women only get a certain window of opportunity of when they can really make a lot of money and really be out there doing what they need to be doing. So maybe just take advantage of it. Rago. It doesn't matter if you want a long, a long career, a short career take advantage of it because honestly no one is really out here trying to listen to your skill as a dj they don't care about that they care about if you have a lot of followers they care about if you can sell a lot of tickets they care about if you look good on social media which will allow you to have good engagement and get good plays on instagram reels and have a lot of likes on instagram and a lot of whatever whatever they call the likes on fucking tiktok and shit all of that stuff is more important than your actual skill so why not why not use it to your advantage fuck it fuck it it really is fuck it time because the scene in the industry doesn't care that's why i really had a hard time with this whole like gendered quota or the gendered lineups and shit at raves it really was kind of insulting because it kind of suggested that there wasn't a whole slew of people out there just imagine i'm not even a fucking white male right i'm not even a boring looking white male those guys that always used to play minimal events back in the day but can you imagine how annoyed you'd be being a boring looking white male who was around the minimal time and you could never play because all the minimal dj heads that were playing back then were the same old people that are still around now right the lucianos the ricardo villalobos and all these type of guys right um the zip and all these type of things right and then imagine you're trying to come up during the minimal heyday and they're not letting you play because only the big guys are playing and then people tell you oh no we're gonna make the, the lineups 50 50 now women and men so now your chances of playing have gone down to 50 those 50 they're gonna play from men's side are definitely gonna be people that don't look like you they're definitely gonna be more people that look like me and then they're also gonna pick loads of women just because they happen to be born women or they happen to be identifying as women. That would be super frustrating. So the whole gendered lineup thing doesn't actually address the issue, which the issue is there's not enough fresh lineups in general, whether it's in the LGBTQ queer scene, whether it's in the POC scene, whatever scene it is, it's still the same 10 to 20 people playing the same fucking raves or it's playing different type of raves but it's the same bloody lineups really for the most part and that's the main thing that needs to be kind of sorted and handled but they don't really which is why you have to give places like Bergheim really a lot of credit because even though they're a big club and they have all their issues they do really well to kind of platform and to give chances to people who are fairly unknown a good example is that DJ Maria right I remember when I checked her profile the first time she got booked in Bergheim I can pretty much I'm pretty certain I remember her followers being like 2,000 or something on Instagram. Maybe even less. Yeah, maybe even less than that. Just around the kind of followers that I have on there, right? And she got booked to play at Burkhan. And then suddenly now, I think her profile is obviously blown up. But that clearly showed you that she was somebody that was maybe known on the local scene, maybe known to people behind the scenes or the bookers over there in Burkhan. But 
it was wasn't a booking that was done because she can sell a bunch of tickets and she's super famous. No, it was a booking done because they liked her music, they respected her as an artist, and they went to give her a chance. And you don't see that happening enough, you know. You so that's why people are having to do this whole like, oh, let's do gendered lineups, let's make it half black, you know, and brown people, um, people who who kind of present as a certain way, but people are set from a certain sexual orientation. It's like no, the main issue is that you need fresh faces in general. Forget picking people based on their genders and stuff like that. Just bring in fresh faces and then all that stuff will sort itself out but it don't and this situation we're in so if that situation we're in use whatever you can use um to get further and then once you get in make sure that you focus on the art because unfortunately if you keep presenting in this way and that's the only thing that you're selling you can't then complain i don't think when you then attract a very toxic part of the dance music scene that also exists that only likes a luke oogle at attractive young ladies who dance behind the flipping um decks and shit you have to be conscious of that. I'm I'm sure they are. Don't get me wrong, but you know I think that's an unfortunate part of the scene that there's also a group of like weird dudes that hang around, you know, following, um, you know, quote unquote hot DJs around and shit and propositioning stuff on social media. It's very very odd. But in general, that's why I thought when I saw it. So big up. What's her name? DJ Hot Girl. What is it again? Dragon Girl or something? uh dj dragon girl available now hall september 19th dj dragon girl check it out if you haven't already let me just check it off mute so you can hear briefly what it sounds like yeah you, you, you get a gist in it you get the gist you get the gist so yeah big up dj dragon girl i'm smashing it doing her thing hopefully you enjoyed that hopefully you liked what you saw and if you enjoyed that please make sure you check out her whole mix available where you know where whole mixes are and you can listen to that at your leisure listen to that at your leisure 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 next on the list let's talk about this clip so this clip has been going viral of Ye basically screaming at some person on the phone and talking about how cardi b is an industry plant and you know this is everything that we kind of know it's not nothing he's saying here is really out of turn or out of pocket i'm surprised why it really went crazy and people are kind of you know flipping out about it i think most people even if you're a fan of cardi b would probably agree with this um assertion of the situation and considering how cardi b's career has played out since the first album dropped and her inability to really put out a decent second album and her you know refusal of you know trepidation to put her work out in that way and maybe the work not matching the stuff that she did in the beginning it's fair to say that those industry plants um accusations are somewhat true let's play the video of yay making that clear paranoid shit yes Corey cia <laughs> Corey got like he didn't even have to say it i know it you fucking CIA. What are you talking about? Like, what the fuck? Oh, the, oh this is my, this is my job, brother. This is my, this is my job. These Illuminati. <laughs> that's why, that's why, Car that's why fucking Cardi B was over there. Cardi B is a plant by the Illuminati. She don't write her raps. She's just there to like sound as ignorant as possible and just, and then make songs like fuck them and then get some money. Yeah. You know, she was literally replaced you know Nicki Minaj purposely that they put her there and now she doesn't know what to do and she's just a fucking she has no idea what the fuck is going on she thinks it's just a blessing from the universe there ain't no blessing from the fucking universe that's not some paranoid shit so the interesting thing about this is that what he's saying about Corey Gamble is something that I've always thought and I've always been a bit perplexed by. But if you actually zoom out a little bit, you've probably always encountered, especially if you're a part of a little, uh, you know, um, a little subculture and stuff. Corey Gamble personalities always do exist, right? And this Corey Gamble guy is the black dude that hangs around the Kardashians, um, older guy who was, I'm not sure if he's still going out with Kris Jenner, the mum of all the girls over there. But essentially, he's somebody that now adopts the role of being the nanny or something of all the girls i don't really know what's going on there but some sort of assistant nanny guy but obviously he's also dating chris jenner who's the mum of all the kardashians and the jenners over there cool whatever nice one to hear that the thing about Corey gamble is that he's such an unremarkable average kind of like person it's pretty interesting to see how he managed to kind of worm his way into that group of people like because you'd imagine they have a pretty um 
high wall or high bar for the people that have to get into their inner circle right it probably takes a lot for as much as we rag on them for being a bit dumb and being a bit vapid and shallow and shit i'm sure to be a part of their social group it's not just as easy as having money or just knowing people it takes a lot of stuff happening at once to kind of get you situated next to them and to be friends with them because they usually probably keep a tight circle because of all the things they're involved with and the, the you know and the tendency of people to spill beans and to reveal stuff about them blah blah blah, blah. so they have to do that but somehow he's managed to do that and he's managed to stick around for ages he even though when they may they may have may not have broken up him and christiana um even though there may have been stuff to do with the family the one thing that's been constant with the kardashian jenners has been Corey gamble and how has he done that how has he done that but then i think about the scenes that i've been involved in the subculture i've been involved in there's always that one or there's always that one person or there's always that one guy or girl who manages to kind of worm their way into a position that they don't really deserve just through pure cunningness and really adept networking and social climbing and shit and maybe that's what Corey gamble did maybe he was a guy with a dream who just sat there and said hey i want to be a part of this hollywood hills la um, establishment of people i want to be a part of these people because i know how important it is that your network is solid and i think in america more so for probably here i think when you want to reach those upper echelons of places you definitely do need friends in higher places and oftentimes being the friend of somebody very rich can really transform your life also like knowing how to play your position and just being the the kind of person that they can depend on um, and they can rely on so maybe that's what he did he made himself useful um he made himself completely available and they saw that saw that he was loyal saw that he was consistent saw that he didn't you know betray them in any way shape or form because so far he hasn't come out with and tell or anything and i think they then kind of stood by him and now he's been basically welcomed as a part of their family extended family which is kind of interesting and then going on to the Cardi B thing, I think it's fairly evident and clear to see that the industry at large, they do that all the time. I think they did it a little bit with Chance the Rapper when he was coming up to maybe replace um, Drake. Maybe there was an idea to do the same thing with Kendrick, with Drake, but then Kendrick turned into be more of an artist as opposed to somebody that's willing to go toe-to-toe with um, you know, um, Drake in terms of the commercial artist thing and do the whole album per year thing. He's never going to do that. Um, and then they maybe wanted to do that as well with Chance the Rapper. Um, sorry, I said Chance the Rapper, Donald Glover maybe the same thing. They kind of have this, I, this tendency to kind of pit people against each other to sort of play you know musical chairs and to kind of make sure the next person's always on the come up and it's clear to see that the industry at large probably always knew that Nicki Minaj was probably not the most malleable and easiest person to control uh, and to kind of get to do certain things so maybe the plan was to always to try to get someone else in that they could probably control um more easily than car than Nicki Minaj than by getting Cardi B involved. And that's no coincidence than when Cardi B came in, the whole Grammys thing, which was really obscene, even though that album was really good, the first one, even though that was the album too that she got the most help with and those producers and writers and shit. It was a really good kind of debut album to come out of the block with, especially for somebody that was never an artist to begin with. To get the Grammy and to all that sort of stuff, it kind of felt like the industry were trying their best to prop her up more in the hopes that it will take out Nikki, but Nikki's also got a crazy fan base and she's still clearly a true artist even though she had a dalliance and a kind of dabbling of being a pop star she's still somebody has kind of shown over the years that she cares a lot about being you know regarded as a proper proper artist in a conventional sense and obviously a really high level rapper so she was okay with i no, i was okay but maybe content or maybe accepted that the industry was never she was never gonna be industry darling and then you know certain things that she's done in her own personal life and the things that she's said and stuff and the people that she's now married to and the family all this sort of stuff i'm sure hasn't maybe helped how she's been perceived by people in the industry because you know the industry people play like to play those games but i don't think it's crazy what kanye said about cardi i think most people with logic with brains would say the same thing about her also even if you're a fan that she's definitely industry planted because of how she came in through love and hip-hop and stuff having no real musical quote-unquote training or experience beforehand and then ascending to the way that she did and also as well i think a lot of things people don't miss is the amount of things that she's been able to get away with in her career like mistakes and faux pas and stories that she's told about her come up and stuff where you'd think if that was somebody else um they would definitely not be at the level that she's at now so i think all of those things 
clearly show that there's definitely a protection a sort of ring around her that enables people to kind of, that kind of lets her kind of get away with stuff and whatever it may be anyway that clip was taken obviously from an unreleased documentary that's come out that's been very eye-opening to see for a lot of kanye fans myself included because it's been very clear to see that yay is very much yay even behind cameras when he knows he's not being recorded for like an interview or something yes this guy was being recorded since 2018 allegedly for this footage for a long far-reaching you know uh, documentary documenting his entire journey and whatnot it's going to be pretty cool to see it finally come out when it gets finally polished and done up whatever it may be but it's been quite cool to see that kanye is the same whether he knows he's been interviewed or not He's, he's on the same level of fucking turn up but when you watch the documentary it's also kind of sad because you can see his mental deterioration going on as you watch the documentary because it starts from 2018 ish i'm assuming and it kind of goes into the present day and you can kind of see him getting worse and worse mentally and then one thing that's really sad about it is that he clearly has a lot of yes men around him and there's people around him that also maybe just feel like they aren't in the position to say anything to him because it's fucking Kanye West. So he's able to kind of fly off the handle, say crazy shit because no one can chat to him. He's that untouchable. That's how scary and wild that shit is. That like Kanye is at a level now where no one can speak to him. No one can give him any sort of like, you know, any, any sort of like, I don't know, any sort of criticism back any pushback and nothing they just let him go and in this particular clip he's taking he's at some photo shoot <laughs> i'm not just sure what it was for maybe it was a time magazine thing or whatever and he starts just ranting and raving about good music and how he wants to dissolve it about tiana taylor about Pusha t and daytona and how he should have gave him their best his best work and just going crazy as kanye would always go and again i just love it because he was he talks like this in, in front of cameras when he's being interviewed and clearly behind cameras when he knows he's not being interviewed so great to see he's on the same amount of time let's play kanye going crazy. It ain't gonna be in this situation. It's gonna be a get me out this motherfucking good music shit now. And Scooter ain't gonna be no, oh, I'm still putting my name on a shit. I need to get rid of good music because I'm great. And guess what? Good is the enemy of great. The fuck I'm doing giving Wanna Love You to fucking Tiana. What the fuck I'm doing giving that Daytona album to Pusha? What the fuck I'm doing, bro? That shit like, I, that shit was three dark fantasies that I gave away. Cop shot the kid, Nas rapping all goddamn offbeat on it, don't even want to shoot a video. They shoot the video, don't even tell me. These motherfuckers don't appreciate me. All these motherfuckers is trying to use me. I'm the greatest motherfucking artist living and I can do everything. And I'm not being expanded and my vision is not being expanded to what it is. I'm performing at other people's festivals and shit. I've been wanting a fucking festival. People not touring my shit, people saying I'm locked in a I've been recouped. These niggas made fa fake black skinheads. I got the fake black skinhead. Marty Van Deer told me, I'm sick. I'm sick. Ain't nobody reach me. Y'all boys better not fuck with me, bro. These boys better not about to play that black, black, black skinhead on Twitter live quick. And I know my life is on the line when I'm talking. But I know ain't nobody gonna touch me because I'm too high profile. I'm not triple X. So y'all can't take me out. But I bet you I get off my motherfucking publishing. I bet you I get my motherfucking festival. And I bet you I get off a of universal. And I bet you y'all don't talk to Adidas again. Oof. He's on the phone spitting that hot fire mix. So if you're Tiana Taylor, this definitely confirms. I'm sure she knows this, but it was unfortunate that that relationship or that um, professional relationship um, didn't work out as well as well as it should have. Um, clearly, something happened behind the scenes. The Pusha T thing is pretty depressing and sad because Pusha T's been a very loyal soldier to Kanye to the point where I'm sure it's definitely hampered or damaged his. I won't say damaged. I'm sure it's definitely had a negative impact in some aspects of his, you know, artistic career. Be, you know, being so down to defend Kanye. I'm sure because he's not down with defending Drake and he's obviously being friends with Kanye then means he's obviously an up with Drake and obviously him and Drake obviously already have their issues. I'm sure that definitely has impacted him some ways in the industry because industry people always like to play games and they've got different teams and camps and shit. So he's a loyal servant, loyal soldier to flipping yay and here he is disrespecting him the way he is on the phone and saying what he said about him. But I'm sure he knows about this too behind the scenes and you know I don't doubt the, all these people being spoken about know how yay feels because he's spoken 
you know, he, he's made it known how he feels about them and it's got back to them in some way, shape or form. This is not a secret, I'm sure. This is not like I'm surprised to them. I think it's more so shocking to the audience like myself to see, oh shit, this guy talks this way to everybody, like whether he's been interviewed or not, and he talks about people that's close to him, maybe even worse than people that he doesn't know. Um, the turn, trying to get off a good music thing is interesting. Um, clearly that was uh, something that he never wanted to be a part of long-term, um, which is disappointing, but I'm assuming that's with the business. I'm assuming because the business started to go really badly, he wanted to then jump off it straight away and didn't want to be a part of it and then started to kind of downplay it and it's important. But I don't think, you know, the legacy of the good music would ever be kind of damaged because Kanye in the end fell out of love with it but I think he fell out more out of love with it because of the business but it does maybe give you an understanding as to why he's gone this different direction when it comes to his business and I don't blame him with the Scooter Braun thing because that Scooter Braun guy did Taylor Swift fucking dirty boy with her masters and you know her having to remake everything to get the money from it and shit like that Scooter Braun guy is a very unapologetic piece of shit and clearly somebody that enjoys playing that side of the business being the guy that gives the 360s giving the guy that has the publishing that has the the masters like a Diddy type of figure right he enjoys being that kind of person that kind of um, industry villain and kind of being the you know the enemy of all flipping artists and shit so clearly Ye did the good thing by going ham and being crazy about it because he eventually did get out of that deal i don't think he's managed with flipping scooter Brown anymore he's not part of his businesses anymore and that was maybe the best way to go about it so this whole idea of burning the boats to get out of certain things is probably the best approach to go about it because this industry if you try and do it any other way in the you know a business way sensible grown-up way you'll never get out of these deals to just keep longing shit off because everybody's making money off your back but if you start publicly calling out these people you start calling their bluff and shit it really does help it can help in the long term that's the actual sad reality of all this shit it can actually help you long term going in so big up yay great to see and that documentary is available i think on youtube find it if you want um it's a two and a half hour one there's also a four hour uncut one but i i warn you the four hour uncut version is very depressing because you see way more bits that obviously been uncut and um i've been cut sorry and you can clearly see the guy isn't really all there, which isn't an issue. But I guess if you were someone like me that was kind of, you know, naive to it, it can kind of really be very startling to see it in kind of full HD. So, yeah, check it out at your peril. Check it out at your peril. Next on the list. And finally, we have to talk about the disastrous home game Man United played against Galatasaray disastrous home game against Galatasaray in the Champions League. Man United 2, Galatasaray 3, Galatasaray 3, Man United 2 at home. The really sad thing about this game wasn't that we got beat. The really sad thing about this game was that Galatasaray were there to be beaten. They weren't, they're not a good team. Any other team in the Champions League, any other team in our group probably puts them away if they perform the way that they did uh, against us at Old Trafford. They're not very good. They're very open at the back. Their front line isn't probably as sharp as it needs to be. They missed a penalty, a couple of chances here and there. Um, they were getting very unnecessarily aggressive and shit in the midfield and in defense and stuff and started to do niggly fouls. So they definitely have a temperament issue. Their fans can also be easily influenced by how badly they play on the pitch. You could see at certain points. So they are there for the taking. But we played so terrible outside of the Rasmus Hoyland goals and performances. We played so terrible as a team, defending midfield and in, in, in parts of our attack that it was only inevitable that they were eventually going to win. I thought a draw after everything that happened in the game would have been a good result. But then considering how the other teams in our, you know, in our Champions League group are playing now, I think Bayern Munich ended up winning 2-1 against Co um, Copenhagen and they, I think, won their first game. It's very, very difficult to see us qualifying from this group, which is obviously isn't, I don't think, a bad thing either because I'm one of the fans that doesn't really agree with this idea of top four is everything and being a Champions League is a must. I think sometimes being in these cup competitions is only worthwhile if you actually have an option or a possibility of winning just being in it for the sake of hearing the champions league music and being a part of the flipping social media conversation isn't really the greatest thing i think in general because if anything these competitions remind you way more than maybe sometimes the league of how far or your club is from the top teams around the world it really or around europe sorry it really does remind you it's a stark reminder of just how far we have to go and i think most united fans you know, Glazer protests, uh, you know, to one side and blaming them to one side and shit. 
you have to see that even if we get the right manager in, we've got a long way to go to get this team playing anywhere near the level that it can be to be competing in the Champions League, let alone qualifying in our group and let alone trying to win. It's fucking, we're miles apart. Um, the, obviously, the most concerning part for me, I think, has to be the way we conceded the goals. Um, obviously, Onana's mistake um, that led to one of the goals was absolutely diabolical, especially for the penalty. Sorry, sorry. The, 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 the mistake that led to the penalty was absolutely diabolical. Um, then the Onana attempt at trying to save the through ball that Akadi ran onto to score the winner was absolutely diabolical. Also, he went way too, you know, he went to ground way too early, made Akadi's job way easier when he went to go score. But also, I think running that back a bit, Akadi running through the way that he did through one header from Davidson Shantich from his own own half into our half and both Lindelof and Varane looking like they were running in mud and then obviously Amrabat playing him on side which I don't really fault him for because he's a defensive midfielder playing at left back was shocking Icardi is never known for his pace but he completely stripped us at the back ran onto it and finished it really well to let them win you know at the last minute Rasmus Hoyland was one of our only positives. I think maybe alongside Mason Mount. I've given Mason Mount a lot of stick, um, but I honestly do think this was Mason Mount's best ever performance so far playing for Man United. I feel like he performed his role really well in midfield. He was tenacious. He was combative alongside him and um, um, Hassan Medjury. Um, who I don't think is obviously a I don't think he's a great player, but I think what he clearly does is that he plays or he so he complements the midfielders better in that kind of way that Terex and Hag wants us to play than any other midfielder, which I think goes to speak to the overall dependency that Eric Ten Hag has with his favourites that annoys me but going back to Mount I thought Mount played really well throughout the entirety of the game I think maybe alongside um, Hoyland he probably was our best player he probably deserved to get a goal or an assist but definitely the star man has to go to Hoyland Rasmus Hoyland right, that was maybe one of the best um, I've seen striker performances in a long time at United that was everything we want to see in a modern striker holding up the ball being a nuisance to the defenders scoring goals being a threat he basically scored a hat-trick but one of the goals got cancelled um, because of an offside but he was incredible that was such a good performance and that should give most fans hope and, you know, maybe dissuade a little the negative feeling around Hoyland, especially myself. I was having my reservations about some of his runs and shit, whatever it may be. But there's definitely a player there. The only thing is playing up front for United that we've seen with Martial, as we see even with Weghorst when he was here. Um, it's just a, a really thankless task. There's not a lot of good combination play before the ball gets to you. So you're kind of relying on your striking partners or the attacking players or the midfielders having a moment of brilliance to find you there isn't a lot of combination plays where you can kind of expect to get the ball in certain places but I thought the his first goal which I think was a header from Rashford or the cross from, from Rashford I think actually that ball was hit at him a little bit too hard I'm not gonna lie I think the cross in was hit too hard and hit too far back you had to kind of bend back two yards to kind of get the, the ball in from the header, which was still a flipping amazing finish regardless. Um, and then, of course, the second goal, I think, was a tapping close in on the goal. That was really well taken. And then I think the second, the one that would have been the second goal that got cancelled was really good when he dummied the midfielder, sorry, the defender inside the box. But um, the defending and the midfield from us was horrible. Casemiro, probably one of the worst performances I've seen from him in a while. The ill discipline to give away the penalty like he did in the box was stupid even though they didn't score for the penalty because Icardi ended up missing him sliding in like that against the player in the box was so flipping stupid honestly one of the worst um, red cards I've seen in my entire life especially when you think about he's already on the yellow card he's already on the he, 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 he's already on the yellow card um, Onana obviously does the, the worst thing possible by passing the ball straight um, from the box, trying to get to flipping Casemiro. It doesn't get to him. And then in Casemiro's effort to try to get back to stop, um, I think it's Mertens from getting into the box, he slide tackles him and that gives away the flipping penalty, right? An absolutely stupid error for Ca for a player of Casemiro's experience to make in the box. Crazy. And I think personally, he didn't need to do that. He could have still let Mertens run into the box and attempt to try to score pass on Nana from the angle 
that he was at or whatever he was going to do. We still had 11 men and we could go again to try to rescue a point from the game or whatever it may have been. It wasn't all, it wasn't, all hope wasn't lost. So I don't know why he did such a drastic decision to go and slide tackle him like that, especially on the yellow card. That ill discipline um, from somebody to experience was really horrible to see. I thought Varane against Galatasaray was very, very, very bad. Like that was one of the most concerning performances I've seen from Varane because if anything, that was a, that was a reminder of maybe just how far he's fallen off as a player. Maybe he's just not at the level that we need anymore. Maybe that is just the level that we're seeing of Iran now is where he's at. And it kind of goes back to the idea that I think a lot of fans said, you know, clubs like Real Madrid don't get rid of players like or let players like Varan and Casemiro leave unless they are surplus to requirements. Those type of top teams don't really let go of those type of players unless they're no longer necessary. They're no longer needed. They're not of the you know, they're not of the appropriate kind of level to play at their level anymore. And maybe that's the reason why they ended up at United. Maybe they ended up at United because they were surplus to requirements at Real Madrid as opposed to them wanting to play at the top level still and coming to United because obviously we pay crazy wages and they know they're not going to really have any competition for a place there. So they come over here and then we end up having um, a has-been um, two players in the most crucial positions, defensive midfield and one of our centre-backs playing there. And maybe Varane also is carrying an injury. I'm not really too sure what's going on, but he looked terrible, especially alongside flipping, um, what's his thing, uh, Lindelof, who's always is bad especially when he's playing against strikers or attacking players who are dynamic and do crazy stuff um a lot of credit goes to flipping Wilfred Zaha for his first goal again he played for us a long time ago he had a really bad time uh, at United various conspiracy theories around why he didn't exactly hit the ground running maybe his you know beef with David Moyes and the whole drama allegedly behind David Moyes daughter and shit was not true who knows but it didn't go well for him at United and it's nice to see that he's been able to kind of resurrect his career at Crystal Palace and then get his big move to a Champions League club which we always wanted playing for Galatasaray and then he came to back to the club and was able to silence the boot boys and score the opening goal the only issue I have with it is that Dallo should never, ever, 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 ever allow flipping Zaha to do what he did to him for that goal. That is not, that is just not acceptable. The ball gets, again, long balls into the area. It, it felt like we we're playing a Sunday league club, honestly, the way the goals that were scored, with the, with the exception of the... What are the oh the good goal actually even a good goal that was a fucking one two on the side that Amrabat missed that also felt like a sign because it was very easy um very kind of formulaic and easy to predict type of thing you'd imagine players that kind of level would have been able to stuff that out but regardless long boot through the middle um then kind of bounces and again if you know if you played at any level of football Sunday league semi pro you know you're not ever meant to let the ball bounce especially when it's near your box Dallo does and by that point. Um, Zaha expertly pins him back uses him as a shield and then as the ball's bouncing up in the box he then is able to volley it into the ground and it loops over flipping Onana I have an issue with Onana and his positioning for the goal I feel like the only way Zaha was going to score that was by doing that volley into the ground so that it would hit the ground and pivot over his head I feel like he should have positioned himself a little bit further back into the goal to be able to push the ball over the flipping bar but Onana is very suspect so far. I'm very disappointed with Onana because I think Onana, we had this idea that he was going to flip and replace um, De Gea in the goal and be a better flipping goalkeeper and shit. And he was going to be able to play out from the back because he's better with the ball at his feet. But from what we've seen so far, Onana is a very much average shot stopper as a goalkeeper. And he's also not that great with the ball at his feet. He's always got a mistake in him always and I think the mistake that led to the penalty wasn't even a high pressure situation I don't think he could have I don't think he was kind of pushed into a corner and he had only one option to go to but to pass it straight to flipping Casemiro that was just an again maybe a lack of concentration maybe his confidence is low that's a really frustration and worrying part of it it's not even like he's doing risque things to try to advance us off the pitch by doing Cruyff turns and trying to do risque passes that would have if it worked out that would have been amazing no it's a fairly simple I feel like place like where he receives the ball here he could have easily passed it out to the sides he could have easily kicked it out and he decides to pass it straight and it goes into the path of flipping Mertens, who runs onto it. And by that time, Casemiro is too late to try to get the ball back. And finally, 
Finally, we have to talk about the two of my most despised players currently playing for fucking Man United at the moment, Bruno Fernandes and flipping Marcus Rashford. Bruno Fernandes at the moment is playing so badly, it's making me question what is the point of training at professional football clubs? Surely, just because you are on paper the best player and because in the past you have amazing stats, if you're not playing well at this current moment, why can't you get dropped? Why is Eric Ten Hag incapable of dropping this guy, of subbing him off, of maybe giving him a break out of the limelight, giving him a break out of playing all the time and playing somebody else to maybe try to, you know, have this competition for places thing going on. So maybe he can maybe feel a little bit motivated to come on and play and try his best or maybe try to resurrect his form. What's happening with our club that we're incapable of benching such a average, I feel like, player? You don't win Champions Leagues and Premier League titles with a player like Bruno Fernandes anyway. It's not as if he's a top, top echelon player, in my personal opinion. So why aren't we capable of just benching him? That's the thing that I don't understand because he's playing so badly today. Yes, he had to play on the right wing. He didn't play in his favourite centre midfield, which again is an issue in these high-profile games in the Champions League or the games that really matter. For some whatever reason, Eric Ten Hag prefers to have Bruno Fernandes playing on the right as some sort of makeshift winger that can tuck in from time to time. That maybe says a lot about his inability to maybe play in that role. I'm not too sure. But his tendency to shoot when he needs to pass, to pass when he needs to shoot, it's just annoying the hit and hope balls, the inability to kind of really control the ball and dictate the flow of the game and tend to just kind of just get out of his feet first time and always go for the long ball. It's so fucking frustrating. It really is frustrating how it is. Honestly, I absolutely deplore it and I don't know why in this position. And then the other player, who's also going to be the reason why most likely Eric Ten Hag will get sacked, is Marcus Rashford himself. Marcus Rashford is playing so badly right now, you're almost questioning. It's almost making you realise, actually, why flipping Jadon Sancho is refusing to apologise to Eric Ten Hag. I get it. I get why Jadon Sancho is refusing to apologise to Eric Ten Hag because if you're Jadon Sancho and you think you're training well, but the manager doesn't, cool, whatever, difference of opinion, but then you see Marcus Rashford pulling up absolute stinkers week in, week out, but still getting picked, you're going to have an issue with this idea that, oh, if you train well, that's how I pick you. Because clearly, he's not only getting picked because of training, he's getting picked because of his past form from last year, from last season that probably helped keep, you know, Asian Hag in a job and obviously recover the season. Fair enough. He did a lot last season. But now he's playing horrendous. And for whatever reason, he keeps getting rewarded and keeps playing. And I absolutely despise it. It's one of the things that really annoys me the most about this modern day United are these mediocre and average players who I feel like feel like they're entitled to play and to start for the club. They feel like they're way better than what they actually are and they're a detriment to the overall culture of our team because what's happening, I feel like having played, again, only at Sunday league level, but I know because I was never really that great at football, but when I was playing... I knew that sometimes if players were being ahead of me just because of the relationship with the manager or whatever it may be, it would definitely not help my motivation when it came to training. And I will remember because I was always on the bench, you'd always hear dissatisfaction from players on the bench because the players that were playing in front of them, they didn't feel like were that better than that much better than them and they were only playing because of favoritism. That can be a very destructive um, thing to have in the dressing room. You have to get rid of it instantly. You can't have players feeling like they're above getting dropped like they're entitled to always play. That isn't the right way to go about things. Even if you don't have options, I don't think it's the right way to go. I don't agree with it because I feel like football should always is a team sport at the end of the day. Unless you're at the top echelons where you've got actual game changers who can actually change the game for you at a drop of a dime. For the most part, you're relying on your teammate to do something to help you in order to help the team. If that's the case, get the best person for the role, put them in place there and let it go from there. But for some reason, it doesn't really happen. And at United, I think now we're in a position where Eric Ten Hag is really in a weird position now because all those things that he should have done, those strong positions he should have made or decisions he should have made with certain players in our team, like whether or not to give Bruno Fernandes the captaincy, whether or not to fucking persist with Rashford, keeping Martial, um, the defenders, Maguire, all these people that have stood around, all these things he should have done in the first season. That's what strong managers do. They come in, they drop, you know, it's the famous Pep Guardiola and Joe Hart thing in Man City. You come in in Man City, you drop uh, Joe Hart, um, who's the main goalkeeper, 
there because he doesn't play the way that you want to play. And then it kind of sets a precedent. Everybody's on a chopping block. I want to play a certain way. If you don't match that way, you're kind of out of that club. All those things you should have done in the beginning, he hasn't done now. So now he's in the position where he's having to decide, should I pick a fight? Should I pick a war with these players who are popular in the dressing room, who have friends in the media that can undermine me and who have clearly down tools already and can influence the fucking you know, atmosphere in the change room? He's already in a bad position already because he didn't. He wasn't strong enough in the beginning, and now you have players such as Donny Van der Beek and all these other players who are probably sitting there thinking to themselves, "How can I not get into a Champions League squad when you're playing these guys week in week out? These guys aren't that much better than me." You sell Fred, and he's probably thinking to himself, "Are these guys really that much better than me?" You sell fucking De Gea because he's surplus requirements. De Gea's probably sitting there thinking, "For all I've done for the club, do I deserve to get binned the way that I did? Did, did get binned?" That's the thing that is really at the crux of it like and i'm not really sure when it comes to eric ten Hag, if it's just fucking stubbornness is what's leading to him not wanting to sub and to bench certain players or if he genuinely feels like the results won't change the performances won't change with different players when we've seen it has we played a different midfield a different kind of team against Crystal Palace in the League Cup and we got a better performance, even though the players weren't maybe as good as the players he'd want to naturally start. It worked better for us as a team. Then he scraps it immediately as soon as the better players come back fit again. And then we go back to playing shit and we go back to losing. Or we go back to playing just rubbish and having poor performances. It's not good enough. And I feel like now with this whole mood around the club and stuff and the lack of you know information when it comes to the ownership change, he's really not hiding to nothing because the Glazers won't want negative press. They'll eventually, in order to protect themselves, they'll eventually just fire him and just get somebody else in again and the cycle then continues. So as much as I don't want him to get fired because I feel like it will take the attention away from the Glazers, it's also getting to the point where you're thinking to yourself like, what are you doing with these guys in training? We're not seeing any style of play, no patterns of play. We're not really seeing players being improved on. We're not really seeing a, even just the, the Hoyland um even the Hoyland fucking signing, it feels like he's figuring it out on his own. I don't feel like we actually have played in a way that suits him, you know, personally. I don't think so. We have really patterns of play that really suit him. He's having to just figure out on his way and kind of help his teammates understand his game more as the game kind of progresses. And that's basically it. So we're in a really shitty position, but Ericsson Hogg really needs to really fix up and work it out ASAP. If not, he is fucked. But, this match was one of those ones that kind of just reminded me of how far we are. And I wouldn't say it broke me because I think I've been broken already. I've just kind of given up kind of caring, even though I've been rambling for more than 20 minutes. I wouldn't say it's broken me in that regard, but it definitely has led me to believe that this club is just toxic from top to bottom. The players, the managers, there's something about his club that just turns good players into terrible players that makes competent managers lose the plot because this Eric Ten Hag that we saw at Ajax isn't the same guy we're seeing now at United. The principles that he had at Ajax, the way that he played football is completely different. The player profiles that he had in the team are completely different. Like, what is going on? I really don't understand what the deal is. I really don't get it. I would love to know. But for some reason, we are where we are and I feel like it's only going to get worse before it gets better unfortunately for United fans it really is the case and I for one can't wait for us to get knocked out of Champions League because we don't need to be in this competition getting our asses handed to us by Galatasaray at home it's not worth it I'd rather not play it I'd rather even not be in the Europa League fuck it scrap it concentrate on the league concentrate on actually you know training these players and coaching them correctly you know developing some players if, if need be and then going again next season but this whole just being in competition for the sake of it to feel like we're a top club and we're, we're far from being one is not it and these players are a fucking embarrassment every single one of that played with the exception of Hoyland and maybe Mason Mount they're all fucking disgraces and it's I can't imagine how annoying it must have been to be a United fan watching that game in person at Old Trafford with it raining and shit and seeing a mediocre Galatasaray side dunking on us the way they did fuck all of them honestly what a terrible terrible performance and i can't wait until the season's over already and we get new owners i hopefully we hopefully do get new owners soon the guys just haven't fucking confirmed what's going on at the moment there's some rumblings about um you know um, jim the ratcliffe um kind of coming in with a minority stake option to buy the club which is a nightmare but i obviously want the other um saudis to come in or whatever to buy us out shake Jasim, sorry hopefully 
because it's going to be a hundred percent buyout and that's what we need we need that we just need a cultural reboot we need a change from top to bottom and i hope when the new owners come in they get rid of everybody they fire the entire board and start from scratch we need that we're desperate for it because at the moment the people that we have currently managing or controlling our club don't know what they're doing man they really don't it's fucking perplexing i fucking hate it i hate united so fucking much with all my fucking heart anyway on that nice positive cheery note I'm going to leave you guys. Thank you for tuning into the Agatino Zinger Show. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time checking out the show, you know what to do. Smash like, hit the subscribe, and all this good like stuff on YouTube. If you're listening through the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review if you can on all the podcast apps that you use, Spotify, Apple, all that good stuff. And of course, if you want, you can share it with your friends and family. And obviously links to the stories I spoke about are in the descriptions and also a link to my Patreon and other social media links can be found in the description also. For now, you should hear my tune of the day playing underneath my voice and I'll hear you guys another time. Or I'll see you guys sorry, another time when I come back. Take care, be safe, everybody. Peace.